During World War I, it was discovered that many of the chemicals for the new explosives they were working on had toxic or even lethal effects on the workers in the munitions factories. Chemicals such as dinitrophenol, or DNP, boost metabolism so much workers were found somewhere along the road after work covered in sweat, with a temperature of 106 degrees Fahrenheit, or even 109 before they die, and then even after death their temperatures keep going up like a total body meltdown. But at subacute doses, workers claim to have grown thin to a notable extent after several months working with the chemical. That got some Stanford pharmacologists excited about the promising metabolic applications of DNP. One dose, an arresting metabolic rate jumps up 30%, an actual fat-burning drug. People started losing weight, no apparent side effects, as a result of their weight-reducing treatment. On the contrary, they felt great, until thousands of people started going blind, and users started dropping dead from hyperpyrexia, fatal fever from the heat created by the burning fat. Of course, it continued to be sold. Here at last is a weight-reducing remedy that will bring a figure men admire and women envy without danger to your health or change your regular mode of living, no diet, no exercise. It did work, but the therapeutic index was razor thin, a razor thin difference between the effective dose and the deadly dose. It was not until thousands suffered irreversible harm that it got pulled from the market, until of course it was brought back by the internet for those dying to be thin. There is a way. Our body naturally burns fat to create heat, though. When we're born, we go from a nice tropical 98.6 in our mother's womb straight to room temperature, and we're all wet and slimy. This represents a challenge for thermoregulation, for maintaining our warm body temperature. As an adaptive mechanism, the appearance of our unique organ around 150 million years ago allowed mammals to maintain our high body temperatures. That unique organ is called brown adipose tissue, or BAT whose role is to consume fat calories by generating heat in response to cold exposure. The white fat in our bellies stores fat, but the brown fat, located up between our shoulder blades, burns fat. It's essential for the thermogenesis, the creation of heat in newborns, but is considered kind of unnecessary in adults, has been considered unnecessary, who have you know, higher metabolic rates and increased muscle mass for shivering to warm us up if we ever get cold. So we used to think it was just, just kind of shrank away when we grew up. But if it was there, then it could potentially make a big difference for how many calories we burn every day, but supposedly we outgrew it. But when PET scans were invented to detect metabolically active tissues like cancer, oncologists kept finding hot spots in the neck and shoulder regions that on CT scan turned out to be not cancer, just fat. Then some observant radiologists noticed they appeared in patients mostly during the cold winter months. And when we looked closer at tissue samples taken from people who had undergone neck surgery, we found it. Brown fat in adults. The common message from these studies is that BAT is present and active in adults, and the more we have, the more active it is, the thinner we are. And we can rapidly activate our fat-burning brown fat by exposure to cold temperatures. For example, you hang out in a cold room for two hours in your undies and put your legs on a block of ice for four minutes every five minutes, and you can elicit a marked increase in energy expenditure thanks to brown fat activation. So hey, these studies point to a potential Natural intervention to stimulate energy expenditure, turn down the heat, and burn calories, and reduce your carbon footprint in the process. But thankfully for those of us who would rather not lay our bare legs on blocks of ice, our brown fat can also be activated by some food ingredients. Until about 10 years ago, brown adipose tissue was considered to be biologically active only in babies and small children, generating heat by burning fat. But there is now no doubt that active brown fat is present in adult humans, involved in cold-induced increases in whole-body calorie expenditure, and thereby the control of body temperature and how fat we are. In 2013, researchers showed that one could activate brown adipose tissue if you chill out people long enough two hours of cold exposure every day for six weeks, which can lead to a significant reduction in body fat. 
Although they demonstrated the effect of recruitment of human brown fat, it would seem difficult to increase exposure to cold in daily life. Thankfully, our brown fat can also be activated by some food ingredients such as capsaicin, the compound that makes hot peppers hot. Whereas increased physical activity is usually recommended to increase energy expenditure, specific food components such as capsaicin are known to burn off calories and fat. A significant rise in energy expenditure within 30 minutes of eating the equivalent of a jalapeno pepper. Normally, when we cut down on calories, our metabolism slows down, undercutting our weight loss attempts. But sprinkling a third of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper powder onto our meals counteracts the metabolic slowdown and promotes fat burning. They wanted to try giving them more to try to match some of the studies done in Asia, but they were working with Caucasians. And there's a difference in maximum tolerable dose of red chili pepper between Asians and Caucasians. Take some Japanese women, you can boost the fat burned after a high-fat meal too, adding over a tablespoon of red pepper powder. We've known for decades that cayenne pepper increases metabolic rate, but we didn't know how. But now we have studies showing that this class of compounds increases energy expenditure in human individuals with brown fat, but not those without it, indicating that they increase expenditure straight off the bat. And there's all sorts of structurally similar flavor molecules in other foods, like black pepper and ginger. We expect to activate thermogenesis as well, but they haven't been directly tested. All these results suggest that the anti-obesity effects of pepper compounds are based on the heat-generating activity of recruited brown fat. Thus, repeated ingestion can mimic the chronic effects of cold exposure without having to freeze ourselves. Consumption of spicy foods may help us lose weight, but what about the sensory burn and pain on our tongues, and sometimes in our stomach as well as further on down? So are our only two options for boosting brown fat to freeze our legs or burn our butts? Arginine-rich foods may also stimulate brown adipose tissue growth and development through a variety of mechanisms, which just means eating more soy foods, seeds, nuts, and beans. For the first 90% of our evolution, we ate diets containing less than a quarter teaspoon of salt a day, because for the first 90% of our evolution we ate mostly plants. Uh, we went millions of years without salt shakers, and so our bodies evolved into salt-conserving machines, uh, which served us well until we discovered salt could be used to preserve foods. Without refrigeration, this is a big boon to human civilization. Of course, this may have led to a general rise in blood pressure, but who cares if the alternative is starving to death because all your food rotted away? But where does that leave us now, when we no longer have to live off pickles and jerky? We are genetically programmed to eat 10 times less salt than we do now. Even many low-salt diets can be considered high-salt diets. That's why it's critical to understand what the concept of normal is when it comes to salt. Having a normal salt intake can lead to a normal blood pressure, which can help us die from all the normal causes, like heart attacks and strokes. Doctors used to be taught that a normal systolic blood pressure is approximately 100 plus H. Systolic blood pressure means the top number. And indeed, that's about what we're born with. Uh, babies start out with a blood pressure around like 95 over 60. But then as we age, that 95 can go to 120 by our 20s, then 140 by our 40s, the official cutoff for high blood pressure, and keep climbing as we age. That was considered normal, since everyone's blood pressure creeps up as we get older. And if that's normal, then heart attacks and strokes are normal too, since risk starts rising once we start getting above the 100 we had as a baby. But if blood pressures over 100 are associated with disease, maybe they should be considered abnormal, perhaps caused by our abnormally high salt intake, 10 times more than what our bodies were designed to handle. Maybe if we just ate a natural amount of salt, our blood pressures naturally would not go up with age, and we'd be protected. Of course, to test that theory, you'd have to find a population in modern times that doesn't use salt or eat processed food or go out to eat. For that, you'd have to go deep into the Amazon rainforest. Meat, 
the Yanomamo people, a no-salt culture, lowest salt intake ever reported, which is to say normal for our species salt intake. And so what happens to their blood pressure? They start out with a blood pressure of about 100 over 60, and end up with a blood pressure of about 100 over 60. Though theirs is described as a salt-deficient diet, that's like saying they have a diet deficient in Twinkies. They're the ones, it seems, eating normal salt intakes, apparently leading to truly normal blood pressures. Those in their 50s having the blood pressure of a 20-year-old. The percentage of the population tested that had high blood pressure? Zero whereas elsewhere in Brazil up to 38% of the population may be affected. The Yanomamos probably represent the ultimate human example of the importance of salt on blood pressure. But look, uh, it could have been uh, other factors. They didn't drink alcohol, ate a high-fiber plant-based diet, lots of exercise, no obesity. There's a number of plant-based populations eating little salt that experience no rise in blood pressure as they age, so you know, how do we know what exactly is to blame? I mean, ideally, we do an interventional trial. I mean, imagine if you took people literally dying from out-of-control high blood pressure, so-called malignant hypertension, where you go blind from bleeding into your eyes, your kidneys shut down, your heart fails, and then you withhold from those people blood pressure medication, so their fate is certain death, and then you put them on a Yanomamo level of salt intake, a normal for human species salt intake, and if instead of dying they walked away cured of their hypertension, that would pretty much seal the deal. Enter Dr. Walter Kempner and his rice and fruit diet. Patients coming in with blood pressures of 210 over 140, dropping down to 80 over 60. Now the reason he could ethically withhold all modern blood pressure medications and treat with diet alone? The drugs hadn't been invented yet. This was back in the 1940s. Now the diet wasn't just extremely low salt, but strictly plant-based, extremely low fat protein calories, but there's no doubt that Kempner's rice diet achieved remarkable results, and Kempner is now remembered as the person who demonstrated beyond any shadow of a doubt that high blood pressure can often be lowered with a low enough salt diet. Forty years ago, it was acknowledged that the evidence is very good, if not conclusive, that a low enough reduction of salt in the diet would result in the prevention of essential hypertension, that rising of blood pressure as we age, and its disappearance is a major public health problem. It looks like we knew how to stop this four decades ago. In that time, how many people have died? Today, high blood pressure may wipe out 400,000 Americans every year, a thousand unnecessary deaths every day. Botanically speaking, seeds are small embryonic plants. The whole plant stuffed in a tiny seed, surrounded by an outer layer packed with vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals to protect the seedling's plant's DNA from free radicals. No wonder they're so healthy. And by seeds, using the formal definition, we're talking all whole grains. Grains are seeds. You plant them and they grow. Nuts are just dry fruits with one or two seeds. Uh, legumes, beans, peas, and lentils are all seeds too, as well as cocoa and coffee beans. So finding health-promoting effects in something like cocoa or coffee should not be all that surprising. There is substantial evidence that increased consumption of all these little plants is associated with lower risk of cardiovascular disease. Of course, much of chocolate research is just on how to get consumers to eat more. Well, it didn't seem to matter what kind of music people were listening to when it came to the flavor, intensity, pleasantness, or texture of a bell pepper. People liked chocolate more when listening to jazz than classical rock or hip-hop. Why is this important? So food industries can integrate specific musical stimuli in order to maximize their profits. For example, chocolate companies may incorporate their chocolate products with jazz-like background music to increase consumers' acceptance. They cite an earlier study that demonstrated that people rated oyster consumption more pleasant in the presence of the sound of the sea than in the presence of the farmyard noises. You'd think chocolate would just sell itself, given that it's considered the most commonly craved food in the world. There's certainly not the same degree of interest among patients as to whether or not 
Brussels sprouts might provide similar cardiovascular protection, so it's understandable to hope chocolate provides health benefits. Meanwhile, despite their known benefits, Brussels sprouts languish unloved and unconsumed. One of the potential downsides of chocolate is weight gain. Though cocoa hardly has any calories, chocolate is one of the most calorie-dense foods. Here's 100 calories of chocolate compared to 100 calories of strawberries, for example. A few years ago, a study funded by the National Confectioners Association, who, among other things, runs the website VoteForCandy.com, reported that Americans who eat chocolate weigh on average 4 pounds less than those who don't. But maybe chocolate eaters exercise more or eat more fruits and vegetables. They didn't control for any of that. The findings of a more recent study, though, published in the Archives of Internal Medicine, were less easy to dismiss. No apparent ties to big chocolate. Reporting that out of a thousand men and women they studied in San Diego, those who consumed chocolate more frequently did have a lower body mass index, weighed less than those who consumed chocolate less often, even after adjusting for physical activity and diet quality. It was a cross-sectional study, meaning a snapshot in time, so you can't prove cause and effect. Uh, maybe not eating chocolate leads to being fatter, or maybe being fatter leads to not eating chocolate. Uh, maybe people who are overweight are trying to cut down on sweets. What we need is a study in which people are followed over time, but there was no such prospective study until now. More than 10,000 people followed for six years, and a chocolate habit was associated with long-term weight gain in a dose-response manner, meaning the greatest weight gain over time was seen in those with the highest frequency of chocolate intake. It appears the reason that those cross-sectional studies found the opposite is that subjects diagnosed with obesity-related illnesses tended to reduce their intake of things like chocolate in an attempt to improve their prognosis, explaining why heavier people may on average eat less chocolate. And then the strongest type of evidence, an interventional trial where you split people up into two groups, change half their diets, and indeed, adding four squares of chocolate to people's daily diets does appear to add a few pounds. So, what do we tell our patients? Because many cocoa products are high in sugar and saturated fat, family physicians should refrain from recommending cocoa. That's a little patronizing, though. I mean, you can get the benefits of chocolate without any sugar or fat by, for example, adding cocoa powder to a smoothie. But too often doctors think of that patients can't handle the truth. Case in point, if your patients inquire, ask them what type of chocolate they prefer. If they respond milk chocolate, then it's best to answer that it's not good for them. If they say dark chocolate, though, then you can treat them as if they actually have a brain and lay out the evidence. The phenomenon of postprandial angina was described over 200 years ago, chest pain, that occurs after a meal, even if you're just sitting down and resting. The question is why? It could be intuitively attributed to redistribution of blood flow away from the heart to the gut during digestion. However, such a mechanism could not be demonstrated experimentally. We now know the problem appears to be within the coronary arteries themselves. The clue came in 1955 when researchers found that they could induce angina in people with heart disease just by having them drink fat. This is what was happening in their bloodstream in the six hours after the meal. This is a graph of so-called lactescence, which means milkiness. Their blood became increasingly milky with fat over the next five hours, and each of the 10 attacks of angina was found to occur about four and a half to five hours after the fatty meal, right when blood milkiness was at or near its peak. Here's the curve after a non-fat meal. Same bulk in calories, but made out of starch, sugar, and protein. And no anginal pain was elicited in any of the patients they tested after the ingestion of the non-fat meal. How could just the presence of fat in the blood affect blood flow to the heart. To understand that, we need to understand the endothelium, the inner lining of all of our blood vessels. Our arteries are not just rigid pipes. They are living, breathing organs that actively dilate or constrict depending on what's needed. They thin or thicken the blood, release hormones, and it's all controlled by the single inner layer 
the endothelium, making it the body's largest endocrine organ, the largest hormone-secreting organ, weighing a total of 3 pounds all gathered up, with a combined surface area of 700 square yards. We used to think the endothelium was just an inert layer lining our vascular tree, but now we know better. The endothelium is directly involved in peripheral vascular disease, stroke, heart disease, diabetes, insulin resistance, chronic kidney failure, tumor growth, metastases, venous thrombosis, blood clots, and severe viral infectious diseases. Dysfunction of the vascular endothelium is thus a hallmark of human diseases. Researchers found that low-fat meals tended to improve endothelial function, and high-fat meals tended to worsen endothelial function. And this goes for animal fat, as well as for isolated plant fats, uh, sunflower oil in this case. But maybe it's just the digestion of fat rather than the fat itself. Our body can detect the presence of fat in the digestive tract and releases a special group of hormones and enzymes to deal with it. So researchers tried feeding people fake fat. The real fat deprived the heart of blood. The fake fat didn't. Uh, but maybe our body is smart enough to know the difference? This is the study that really nailed it. They tried infusing fat directly into people's bloodstream through an IV, so your brain doesn't know if you're eating fat or not. And indeed, within hours, their arteries became stiffened, significantly crippling their ability to relax and dilate normally. This decrease in the ability to vasodilate coronary arteries after a fatty meal just when you need it could explain the phenomenon of after-meal angina in patients with known coronary artery disease. The relative paralysis of our arteries for hours after eating fast food and cheesecake may also occur after olive oil. Olive oil was also found to have the same impairment of endothelial function as the rest of these high-fat meals. Sausage and egg McMuffin was the worst, but olive oil wasn't far behind. Studies that have suggested endothelial benefits after olive oil consumption have measured something different. Ischemia-induced as opposed to flow-mediated dilation, and there's not just not good evidence that that's actually an index of endothelial function, which is what predicts heart disease. Hundreds of studies have shown that tests can give a false negative result. Uh, but it's not just olive oil. Other oils have also been shown to have deleterious results on endothelial function, a significant and constant decrease in endothelial function three years after each meal, independent of the type of oil, or whether the oil was fresh or deep-fried. Olive oil may be better than omega-6 rich oils, or saturated fats, but still showed adverse effects. But this study was done on regular refined olive oil, not extra virgin. Extra virgin olive oil retains a fraction of the anti-inflammatory phytonutrients found in the olive fruit, and so does not appear to induce the spike in inflammatory markers caused by regular olive oil. But what does that mean for our arteries? Extra virgin olive oil may have more of a neutral effect compared to butter, which exerted a noxious effect that lasted up to six hours, basically right up to our next meal. In the largest prospective study ever to assess the relationship between olive oil consumption and cardiac events, like heart attacks, there was a suggestion that virgin olive oil may be better than olive oil, but neither was found to significantly reduce heart attack rates after controlling for healthy dietary behaviors like vegetable intake, which tends to go hand-in-hand -hand with olive oil intake. There have been studies, though, showing even extra virgin olive oil, contrary to expectations, may significantly impair endothelial function as well. So why do some studies suggest people's endothelial function improves on a Mediterranean diet, a diet rich in olive oil? Perhaps because it's also rich in whole grains, fruits, vegetables, beans, and walnuts as well. 
dietary fruits and vegetables appear to provide some protection against the direct impairment in endothelial function caused by high-fat foods, including, including olive oil. So improvements in health may be in spite rather than because of the oil. In terms of their effects on postprandial endothelial function, the beneficial components of the Mediterranean diet may primarily be the antioxidant-rich foods, uh, vegetables and fruits, and their derivatives, such as balsamic vinegar. Just adding some vegetables to a fatty meal may partially restore arterial functioning and blood flow. Do coffee drinkers live longer than non-coffee drinkers? Is it wake up and smell the coffee, or don't wake up at all? The largest study ever conducted on diet and health put that question to the test, examining the association between coffee drinking and subsequent mortality among hundreds of thousands of older men and women in the United States. And coffee drinkers won, though the effect was modest— 10 to 15% lower risk of death for those drinking six or more cups a day, specifically due to lower risk of dying from heart disease, respiratory disease, stroke, injuries and accidents, diabetes, and infections. That much coffee was found to increase the death rates of younger people, though under age 55. Hence, based on this study, it may be appropriate to recommend avoid drinking more than four cups a day. But if you put all the studies together, bottom line, coffee consumption is associated with no change or a small reduction in mortality, starting around one or two cups a day for both men and women. On a cup-by-cup -cup basis, the risk of dying was 3% lower for each cup of coffee consumed daily, which all provides reassurance with respect to the concern that coffee drinking might adversely affect health. Well, at least longevity. Health-wise, though a recent population study found no link between coffee consumption and symptoms of GERD, reflux disease, such as heartburn regurgitation, if you actually stick a tube down people's throats and measure pH, coffee induces significant acid reflux, whereas tea does not. Is it just because tea has less caffeine? No. If you reduce the caffeine content of coffee down to that of tea, it still causes significantly more acid reflux. Decaf did cause less, though, so GERD patients might want to choose decaffeinated, or even better, drink tea. Coffee intake is also associated with urinary incontinence, and so a decrease in caffeine intake should be discussed with women who have the condition, or men. About two cups of coffee a day worth of caffeine may worsen urinary leakage in men as well. A 2014 meta-analysis suggested that daily coffee consumption was associated with a slightly increased risk of bone fractures in women, but a decreased risk of fractures in men. Not hip fractures, though. No significant association was found between coffee consumption and risk of hip fracture, though tea consumption may actually be protective against hip fracture, uh, though it appears to have no apparent relationship with fracture risk in general. There are certain populations in particular that may want to stay away from caffeine, for example, those with glaucoma, and possibly even those with a family history of glaucoma. It goes without saying that people who have trouble sleeping might not want to imbibe. Even just a single cup at night can cause a significant deterioration in sleep quality. Then there are case reports, for example, of individuals with epilepsy having fewer seizures after stopping coffee, so I guess it's worth a shot. We used to think caffeine might increase the risk of an irregular heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation, but that too was based on anecdotal case reports, like this one of a young woman who suffered atrial fibrillation after chocolate intake abuse. But these cases invariably involve the acute ingestion of a very large quantities of caffeine. As a result of the notion that caffeine ingestion may trigger abnormal heart rhythms had become you know, quote-unquote common knowledge, and this assumption led to changes in medical practice. More recently, however, the pendulum has, sw has swung in the opposite direction. Why? Because we actually have data now. Caffeine does not increase the risk of atrial fibrillation, and low-dose caffeine, which they defined as less than about five cups a day, may even have a protective effect. Tea consumption also appears to lower cardiovascular disease risk, especially 
when it comes to stroke. However, given the proliferation of energy drinks that contain massive quantities of caffeine, one might want to temper any message that suggests that caffeine is beneficial. Seems a little patronizing, but it's no joke. Twelve highly caffeinated energy drinks within a few hours could be lethal. We've known that being overweight and obese are important risk factors for type 2 diabetes, but until recently not much attention has been paid to the role of specific foods. This 2013 meta-analysis of all the cohorts looking at meat and diabetes found significantly higher risk associated with total meat consumption, and especially processed meat, particularly poultry. But why? There's a whole list of potential culprits in meat. Maybe it's the saturated fat and animal fat. Maybe it's the trans fats are naturally found in meat. Maybe it's the cholesterol or the animal protein. The heme iron in meat can lead to free radicals, and this iron-induced oxidative stress may lead to chronic inflammation, type 2 diabetes. Advanced glycation end products are another problem. They promote oxidative stress and inflammation. And food analyses show that the highest levels of these so-called glycotoxins are found in meat, particularly roasted, fried, or broiled meat, though any foods from animal sources can be potent sources of these pro-oxidant chemicals. In this study, they fed diabetics foods packed with glycotoxins, like chicken, fish, and eggs, and their inflammatory markers shot up. Tumor necrosis factors, C-reactive protein, vascular adhesin molecules, Thus, in diabetes, dietary AGEs promote inflammatory mediators, leading to tissue injury. The good news, though, is that restriction of these kind of foods may suppress these inflammatory effects. Appropriate measures to limit AGE intake, such as eliminating these foods or sticking to just steaming and boiling meat, may greatly reduce the already heavy burden of these toxins in the diabetic patient. These glycotoxins may be the missing link between the increased consumption of animal fat and meats and the development of type 2 diabetes in the first place. Since the 2013 meta-analysis was published, this study came out in which about 17,000 people were followed for about a dozen years. They found an 8% increase in risk for every 50 grams of daily meat consumption. So that's just like a quarter of a chicken breast worth of meat for the entire day it may significantly increase risk of diabetes. Yes, it could be the glycotoxins in meat, or the saturated fat, or the trans fat in meat, or the heme iron, which can actually promote the formation of carcinogens called nitrosamines, though they could also just be produced in the cooking process itself. But this is new. Uh, there appears to be a clear excess of diabetes in those who handle meat for a living. Uh, maybe there's some kind of diabetes-causing zoonotic infectious agent, like viruses present in fresh cuts of meat, including poultry overstimulation of the aging enzyme TOR pathway by excess food consumption may be a crucial factor underlying the diabetes epidemics. But not just any food, animal proteins may not only stimulate the cancer-promoting growth hormone IGF-1, but provide high amounts of leucine, which stimulates TOR activation and appears to burn out the insulin-producing beta cells in the pancreas and contribute to type 2 diabetes. So it's not just the high fat and added sugars. Critical attention has to be paid to the daily intake of animal proteins. In general, lower leucine levels are only really reached by the restriction of animal proteins. As I noted before, to reach the leucine intake provided by dairy or meat, you'd have to eat like you know, 9 pounds of cabbage, 100 apples. And these calculations exemplify the extreme differences in leucine amounts provided by a more standard diet in comparison to a more plant-based diet. I previously reviewed the role endocrine-disrupting industrial pollutants in the food supply may play in a three-part video series. Clearly, the standard American diet and lifestyle contributes to the epidemic of diabetes and obesity, but these industrial pollutants can no longer be ignored. We now have experimental evidence that exposure to industrial toxins alone induces a weight gain, insulin resistance, and therefore it may be an underappreciated cause of obesity and diabetes. Uh, consider what's happening to our infants. Obesity in a six-month-old uh, is not related to diet or lack of exercise. Right, they're now exposed to hundreds of chemicals from their moms, uh, straight through the umbilical cord, some of which may be obesogenic, obesity-generated. 
Given the millions of pounds of chemicals and heavy metals released every year into the environment, it should make us all stop and think about how we live and the choices we make every day in the food we eat. As this 2014 review of the evidence on pollutants and diabetes noted, yes, we can be exposed through some to toxic spill, but most of human exposure nowadays is from the ingestion of contaminated food as a result of bioaccumulation up the food chain. And the main source, about 95% of persistent pollutant intake, is through dietary intake of animal fat. Why is meat consumption a risk factor for diabetes? Uh, why does there appear to be a stepwise reduction in diabetes rates as meat consumption drops? Rather than something they're avoiding in meat, maybe it's something people are getting from plants. Free radicals may be an important trigger for insulin resistance, so antioxidants in plant foods may help. Put people on a plant-based diet, and their antioxidant enzymes shoot up. So not only do plants provide antioxidants, but boost our own anti endogenous antioxidant defenses, whereas on a conventional diabetic diet, they get worse. There are phytonutrients in plant foods that may help lower chronic disease prevalence by acting as antioxidants, anti-cancer agents, and by lowering cholesterol and blood sugar. Some, we're now theorizing, may even be lipotropes, meaning they have the capacity to hasten the removal of fat from our organs, like the liver, thereby counteracting the inflammatory cascade believed to be directly initiated by saturated fat-containing foods. Fat in the bloodstream, due to the fat we wear or the fat we eat, not only causes insulin resistance, but produces a low-grade inflammation that can contribute to heart disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Fiber may also decrease insulin resistance. One of the ways it may do that is by helping to rid the body of excess estrogen. There's strong evidence for a direct role of estrogens in the cause of diabetes, and it's been demonstrated that certain gut bacteria can produce estrogens in our colon. High-fat, low-fiber diets appear to stimulate the metabolic activity of these estrogen-producing intestinal bacteria. This is a problem for men, too. Obesity is associated with low testosterone levels, marked elevations of estrogens produced not only by fat cells, but some of the bacteria in our gut, our intestinal bacteria may produce these so-called diabetogens, diabetes-causing compounds, from the fats that we eat. By eating lots of fiber, though, we can flush this excess estrogen out of our bodies. Vegetarian women, for example, excrete two to three times more estrogens in their feces than omnivorous women, which may be why omnivorous women had 50% higher estrogen blood levels. These differences in estrogen metabolism may help explain the lower incidence of diabetes in those eating more plant-based diets, as well as the lower incidence of breast cancer in vegetarian women who get rid of twice as much estrogen because they get rid of twice as much daily waste in general. Either way, meat consumption consistently associated with diabetes risk. Dietary habits are readily modifiable, but Individuals and clinicians will consider dietary changes only if they are aware of the potential benefits of doing so. The identification of meat consumption as a risk factor for diabetes provides helpful guidance that can you know, set the stage for beneficial behavioral changes. Meat consumption is something doctors can easily ask about, and once identified, at-risk individuals can then be encouraged to familiarize themselves with meatless options. Dry eye disease is one of the most common eye disorders, causing irritation and discomfort, and can decrease functional vision, and sometimes cause a dramatic deterioration in the quality of life. About 5 million American men and women over age 50 suffer from moderate to severe dry eyes, and tens of millions more have mild or episodic manifestations of the disease at a cost of more than $50 billion. In terms of treatment, there are a bunch of drugs and drops on the market that can help. Uh, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars on things like artificial tears, but currently there's no therapy available to actually fix the problem. 
If drugs don't work, doctors can try plugging up the outflow tear ducts, but that can cause complications, cuts such as migrating and eroding into the face, requiring surgical removal, or surgeons can just go and cauterize or stitch up the ducts in the first place. There has got to be a better way. What about prevention? Well, it can be caused by LASIK surgery, affecting about 20 to 40% six months after the operation. With a million LASIK procedures performed annually, that's a lot of people, and sometimes the long-term symptoms can be severe and disabling. It's a long list of drugs that can do it. Antihistamines, decongestants, nearly all the antidepressants, anticonvulsants, antipsychotics, anti-Parkinson's drugs, beta blockers, and hormone replacement therapy, as well as a few herbal preparations. In the developing world, vitamin A deficiency can start out as dry eyes and then progress to become the leading cause of preventable childhood blindness. Vitamin A deficiency is almost never seen in the developed world unless you do it intentionally. There was a report in the 60s of a guy who deliberately ate a vitamin A deficient diet, living off of bread and lime juice for five years, and his eye turned into this. Better than this poor woman, the member of some cult who tried to live off of just brown rice and herbal tea, whose eyes literally melted and collapsed. There are also a couple of case reports of autistic children who refused to eat anything but french fries or, or bacon blueberry muffins or, uh, and, and Kool-Aid and got uh, vitamin A deficiency. And there was a case in the Bronx written up as vegan diet and vitamin A deficiency, but it wasn't the kid's vegan diet. He refused to eat vegetables, consuming only potato chips, puffed rice cereal with non-fortified soy milk, and juice drinks. His patients evidently lacked the skill in overcoming the child's tendency to avoid fruits and vegetables. A plant-based diet may actually be the best thing for patients with dry eyes, those who wear contact lenses, and those who wish to maximize their tear secretions. People with dry eyes should be advised to lower protein, total fat, and cholesterol intake, and increase complex carbohydrates. Increase vitamin A content uh, by eating you know, red, orange, yellow, and dark green leafy vegetables. Increasing zinc and folate by eating whole grains, beans, and raw vegetables, especially spinach. Uh, ensure uh, sufficient B6 and potassium intake by eating nuts, bananas, and beans. Ensure sufficient vitamin C by eating citrus. Eliminate alcohol and caffeine. Reduce sugar and salt intake and increase water consumption to six to eight glasses per day. Well, we know dehydration caused dry mouth. Might dehydration cause dry eyes? Seems kind of obvious, but evidently it was never studied until now. Is the answer to just drink more water? Well, we know that those suffering from dry eye are comparatively dehydrated. They figure that tear secretion decreases with progressive dehydration, just like saliva secretion decreases, giving us a dry mouth. And indeed, as one gets more and more dehydrated, the urine concentrates, and so does tear fluid. But one can reverse that with rehydration raising the exciting prospect that improving whole body hydration by getting people to drink more water might confer important therapeutic effects for patients with dry eyes. The researchers recommend 8 cups of water a day for women and 10 cups a day for men. Colon cancer is a leading cancer killer. Yet there's this paradox in Africa where they rarely get the disease, even in modern times when they are no longer eating their traditional whole food diet. So they're no longer eating lots of fiber and fresh fruits and vegetables. It is likely, therefore, that their continued low prevalence of colon cancer, 50 times lower than ours, is related to their low intake of animal protein and fat. As I explored previously, uh, but why would animal protein and fat increase cancer risk? Well, as I noted in bowel wars, if you eat egg whites, for example, some of the protein isn't digested, isn't absorbed, it ends up in our colon, where it undergoes a process called putrefaction. When animal protein putrefies in the gut, it can lead to the production of the rotten egg gas hydrogen sulfide, which, over and above its objectional odor, can produce changes that increase cancer risk. Putrefying protein also produces ammonia, 
Over a lifetime on a standard Western diet, the bacteria in our colon may release the amount of ammonia found in 1,000 gallons of Windex. A concentration is found day-to-day -day inside the colon on usual Western diets. Ammonia destroys cells, alters DNA synthesis, increases cellular proliferation, may increase virus infection, favor the growth of cancerous cells, and evidently increase virus infection a second time. And it's the products of protein and fat digestion that are to blame such that you can double ammonia concentrations in the colon by eating a lot of meat. But put people on a plant-based diet, and within just one week, the enzyme activity that creates the ammonia in the colon drops like a rock. Other bacterial enzymes are affected as well. Uh, remember how broccoli family vegetables can boost detoxifying enzymes in the liver? Uh, these so-called phase II enzymes, UDP glucuronosyl transferases, uh, they detoxify drugs and chemicals by applying a chemical straitjacket, here shown in red, deactivating the date rape drug GHB, or taking the carcinogens in meat like benzopyrene and rendering them harmless before dumping them back into the intestine for disposal. But if our liver detoxifies it, why is benzopyrene in meat still associated with rectal cancer? Well, certain bacteria in our gut contain the opposite enzyme, a toxifying enzyme, that removes the straitjacket and frees the carcinogen to wreak a last bit of, bit of havoc before it leaves the body. But within one week of eating plant-based, we can drop that enzyme activity in our colon by about 30%. Uh, but this was with a raw extreme vegan diet. Uh, what about a regular vegetarian diet? Compared to a pound of meat a day diet, those placed on a meat-free diet for a month experienced a 70% drop in toxifying activity, which may raise the amount of carcinogens within the colon. And long-time vegetarians exhibit just a fraction of carcinogen-releasing activity compared to those on a standard American diet. So this may all help explain the increased risk in the United States. Researchers put it to the test, though, uh, by taking biopsies from the lining of the colons of Americans versus Africans to measure proliferation rates, how fast the cells are dividing, a marker for increased cancer risk and decreased cancer survival. This is what they found. The black dots denote proliferating cells, which we can see throughout the colons of Caucasian Americans and African Americans. But only a few were seen in the African biopsies— dramatically lower proliferation rates. Overall, higher colorectal cancer risk was associated with higher dietary intakes of animal products and higher colonic populations of potentially toxic hydrogen and secondary bile salt-producing bacteria. And while they were in there to get biopsies, they looked around a little bit, and out of all the African colons they looked at, they only detect four issues out of 18 colons. But out of the 17 African-American or Caucasian colons, they found 21 problems each— uh, polyps, diverticulosis, lots of hemorrhoids. The remarkably pristine condition of the colons of our African volunteers further supports our impression that African colons were, in general, far healthier than American colons. Colon cancer risk in westernized populations may be reduced by decreasing the intakes of animal products, blaming aggressive factors such as animal protein and fat. We've explored how animal protein can putrefy and produce the rotten egg gas, which may be toxic to DNA, but what about the fat? It can stimulate the synthesis and secretion of bile acids into the intestine. That's what bile does, helps the body digest fat. So more fat in the intestines means more bile in the intestines, which wouldn't be a problem except bile acids have long been suspected as being carcinogenic, especially secondary bile acids. See, bile acids stimulate the growth of bacteria, which convert the primary bile acids our liver makes into secondary bile acids, and secondary bile acids have been shown to be cancer-causing. So this could help explain why fat-rich diets are correlated with colon cancer. 
High saturated fat intake is associated with elevated levels of bile, which is what you tend to see in people with colon cancer, and so are considered tumor-producing factors in colorectal cancer development, and perhaps breast cancer, as these secondary bile acids can get absorbed into the bloodstream and circulate throughout the body. This may help explain the extraordinarily low rates of colon cancer in sub-Saharan Africa, with native Africans putting out just a fraction of the secondary bile acids compared to African Americans. Well, if a diet high in animal fat stimulates the growth of these toxic and carcinogenic secondary bile salt-producing bacteria, what about people who don't eat animal fat? We've known for about 40 years that those eating plant-based diets have less bile in their stools and a reduced capacity to create colon carcinogens. Those eating vegetarian produce just a, a fraction of some of the secondary bile acids implicated in cancer, about 70% less. Put people on a plant-based diet, and within just a week, the bacterial enzyme activity to produce these secondary bile acids is cut in half, and within a month, their presence is cut in half as well. One of the most important toxic effects of these bile acids, the BAs and our BMs, is the increased production of free radicals. That's one of the ways they can damage our DNA and undermine our DNA repair pathways. Compared to this diet, if you switch people to a vegetarian diet for just 12 days, you can get a 13-fold drop in hydroxyl free radical production. Hydroxyl radicals are one of the most destructive free radicals, which may increase colon cancer risk. They only last about a billionth of a second, but in that time can convert harmless substances in the bowel to DNA-damaging mutagenic substances, and bioelastins are believed to promote this process. So fecal free radicals may activate carcinogens in the colon. On a standard American diet, the amount of free radicals produced in the stool is quite remarkable, corresponding to that which would be produced by a fatal dose of gamma radiation. So what do we do about it? What's an achievable, practical measure to decrease free radical formation in our colon? Well, we could just eat a more plant-based diet, but there's not a lot of money in cauliflower and carrots, so instead we could attempt to colonize people's colon with uh, genetically engineered antioxidant-producing bacteria. Unhealthy lifestyle behaviors associated with increased risk of premature death include things like smoking and excessive drinking and not eating enough greens. The best way to get your greens is in whichever way you'll eat the most of them, and one way to sneak extra greens into your daily diet is with whole food smoothies, a potent blend of good nutrition in a quick, portable, delicious form. The Mayo Clinic offers this as a basic green smoothie recipe, combining the healthiest of fruits, berries, with the healthiest of vegetables, dark green leafies. Uh, two ounces of baby spinach is about a cup and a half. Uh, curly parsley is another mild beginner green to start with. Surprisingly, the sweetness of the fruit masks the bitterness of the greens, such that the pickiest of children love them, along with any adults who would otherwise not be consuming dark green leafy vegetables for breakfast. Or even fruit, for that matter. The average teen may only be getting about 1 20th of a serving of fruit otherwise, and loops don't count. But offering smoothies can have a dramatic effect on fruit consumption for students who do not want to take time peeling or chewing fruits. Who doesn't have time to chew a fruit? But the milkshakey texture of smoothies may not just boost the quantity of fruit and vegetable consumption, but also the quality. Carotenoid phytonutrients like beta-carotene and lycopene can exist as microscopic crystals trapped within the cell walls of fruits and vegetables, and they're only released when the cells are disrupted. That's why we need to chew really well. Mastication is doctor speak for chewing. We either have to chew better, or choose plants that are easier to chew. For example, while tomatoes have more beta-carotene than watermelon does, the watermelon's beta-carotene is more bioaccessible because it has kind of wimpy cell walls, but the cells of other fruits and vegetables are smaller and tougher to maximize nutrient release. 
food particle size would ideally be reduced down to smaller than the width of the individual plant cells, but you can't do that with chewing. Most vegetable particles end up greater than 2 mm when you chew them, which corresponds to way up here. Whereas if we broke open all the cells, we could release much more nutrition. We can never chew as well as a blender. The particle size distribution from chewing is about what you'd get blending in a food processor for about 5 seconds, or one of those high-speed blenders for maybe half a second. 40 seconds in a blender, and you can break spinach down to a subcellular level. Why does that matter? Well, take folate, for example, the B vitamin in greens, especially important for women of childbearing age. Feed people a cup of spinach a day for three weeks, and their folate goes up compared to control. But even just chop it up finely with a knife first before chewing it, and you end up with more than twice as much ending up in your bloodstream and the same absorption-boosting effect with lutein, the green's nutrient so important for our eyesight. It's not what you eat, it's what you absorb. But for lutein, the boost was only 14%, uh, so a few extra bites of the whole leaf greens would have gotten you just as much, and some other nutrients such as vitamin C aren't affected by pre-chopping at all. And uh, this is less of an issue with cooked vegetables. This is for raw carrots. Boil the carrots for three minutes first, and even just regular chewing can release like uh, ten times more, but not as much as blended. Intense cooking, boiling for 25 minutes, so damages the cell walls that even gulping down large particles can result in significant absorption. But even then, blending may double carotenoid availability, explaining why we may be able to absorb three times the alpha and beta carotene from pureed cooked carrots compared to mashed cooked carrots. So blending vegetables, raw or cooked, into soup, sauces, and smoothies can maximize nutrient absorption. You went to the store and bought it, or toiled in your garden to grow it, you might as well take full advantage of it. Fruits and vegetables are the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet, and dark green leafy vegetables lead the pack. Each of the top five so-called powerhouse fruits and vegetables were greens. And so if we blend them up in a smoothie, or soup, or sauce, we're taking the food with the most nutrition and breaking all those cell walls to dump that nutrition into our bloodstream. Chewing is good, but blending is better in terms of digestive efficiency and absorbing nutrients. But if we suck up all that nutrition such that none of it makes it down to our colon, might we be starving our microbial selves? The reason intact grains, beans, and nuts are better than bread, hummus, and nut butters is that no matter how well we chew, intact food particles make it down to your colon, where they can offer a smorgasbord for your good bacteria. But if your grains, beans, and nuts are finely ground up into flour or paste before you eat it, you may be leaving your gut flora high and dry. Would the same be true for fruits and vegetables? There are special classes of phytonutrients in fruits and vegetables that appear to protect against colon cancer. They can escape digestion and absorption in our stomach and small intestine and end up in our colon to act as prebiotics. Uh, no matter how much we chew, they stay attached to the fiber. But if we use a blender, might we prematurely detach these nutrients? No. Even if you blend the high-speed blender for five minutes, they remain bound to the fiber for transport down to your colon bacteria. You can do smoothie experiments on people with ileostomy bags that drain the contents of the small intestine and show that most of the polyphenol phytonutrients make it out intact. So we don't have to worry we may be robbing Peter to pay Paul when we blend fruits and vegetables. Is there any downside to smoothies then? Well, just a smaller particle size may improve digestive efficiency and gastrointestinal absorption of nutrients from fruits and vegetables. The same may be true for grains, but the concern is that this could boost starch availability and cause a blood sugar spike. For example, here is the rise and fall in our blood sugar in the four hours after eating a half cup of brown rice. 
eliciting a nice gentle bump in our insulin levels to take care of it. It doesn't even go above normal fasting blood sugar levels. But what if we ate the same amount of brown rice, but first ground into brown rice flour, so like a cream of brown rice hot cereal? You get twice the blood sugar, twice the insulin spike. Same amount of food, just in a different form. Another reason why intact grains, intact whole grains, are better than just whole grain flour products. Even just chewing really well can boost the glycemic and insulin response. Here's if you just chew rice regularly, and here's if you chew really well. The smaller rice particles empty out of your stomach faster, producing greater blood sugar and insulin responses. It's ironic that there were health crusaders pushing people to chew more to digest their food better, but if what you're chewing is a five-cheese pizza, maybe it's better not to digest so well. Uh, some have even suggested that diabetics and obese persons not chew their food so much. Uh, swallowing diced food without chewing would not only reduce the pleasure of eating, though, but people could choke on it. Still, though, they suggest it could be a simple way to allow patients to reduce their blood sugar levels without fundamentally altering their diets, and may thus prove more acceptable than having to do the unthinkable, eat high-fiber foods like beans, which have been shown to blunt blood sugar spikes. Even blended beans like hummus? Yes, unlike grains, blending legumes does not affect their glycemic response. So, circling back to the smoothie question, is fruit more like grains or more like beans. If you liquefy fruit in a blender to make a smoothie, do you risk spiking your blood sugar too high? As I've explored previously, drinking sugar water is bad for you. If you have people drink a glass of water with three tablespoons of table sugar in it, which is like a can of soda, this is the spike in blood sugar you get within the first hour. Our body freaks out so much, releases so much insulin, we actually overshoot by the second hour of relatively hypoglycemic, dropping our blood sugar below where it was when we started out fasting. In response, our body dumps fat into our bloodstream as if we're starving because our blood sugars just drop so low. And the same thing happens after drinking apple juice. Here's what happens to your blood sugar in the three hours after eating four and a half cups of apple slices. It goes up, comes down. But if you eat the same amount of sugar in apple juice form, about two cups, your body overreacts, releasing too much insulin, you end up dipping below where you started. The removal of fiber and the production of fruit juice can enhance the insulin response and result in this rebound hypoglycemia. What would happen, though, if you stuck those four and a half cups of sliced apples in a blender with some water and pureed them into an apple smoothie? It would still have all its fiber, yet it still caused that hypoglycemic dip. The rebound fall in blood sugars, which occurred during the second and third hours after juice and puree, was in striking contrast to the practically steady level after apples. This finding not only indicates how important the presence of fiber is, but also perhaps whether or not the fiber is physically disrupted, like in the blender. Let's play devil's advocate, though. Eating four and a half cups of apples took 17 minutes, but to drink four and a half cups of apples in smoothie form only took about six minutes, and you can down two cups of juice in like 90 seconds. So maybe these dramatic differences have more to do with how fast the fruit entered into our system rather than its physical form. If it's just the speed, we could instead you know, sip a smoothie over 17 minutes would be the same, right? So they put it to the test. Fast juice was drinking in 90 seconds, but what if you instead sipped the juice over 17 minutes? Same problem. So it wasn't the speed, it was the lack of fiber. What if you disrupt that fiber with blending, but sip it as slowly as the whole apple eating? a little better, but not as good as just eating the apple. So eating apples is better than drinking apple smoothies. But who drinks apple smoothies? What about bananas, mangoes, berries? There was a study that compared whole bananas to blended bananas and didn't see any difference, but they only looked for an hour, and it was while they were exercising. Bananas in general, though, may actually improve blood sugars over time the same thing with mangoes, and this was with powdered mango. It can't get any more fiber disrupted than that. 
It may be due to a phytonutrient called mangiferin, which may slow sugar absorption through the intestinal wall. Berries help control blood sugar so well they can counter the effects of the sugar water even when they're pureed in a blender. Adding blended berries in addition to the sugar water, and you don't get the hypoglycemic dip. You don't get that burst of fat in the blood. Drinking blended berries isn't just neutral, but improves blood sugar control. Again, thought to be due to special phytonutrients that can slow sugar uptake into the bloodstream. Indeed, six weeks of blueberry smoothie consumption may actually improve whole body insulin sensitivity. So while apple smoothies may be questionable, a recipe like you know, Mayo's basic green smoothie recipe packed with berries and greens would be expected to deliver the best of both worlds, maximum nutrient absorption without risking overly rapid sugar absorption. A famous study in 2000 compared the impact of soda versus jelly beans. They had people add 28 extra spoonfuls of sugar to their daily diet in the form of jelly beans or soda pop. Then they measured how many calories they ate over the rest of the day to see if their bodies would compensate for all that extra sugar. This is how many calories the jelly beans group was eating before the study started. But when eating handfuls of jelly beans, their bodies registered all those extra calories, so they ended up eating less of everything else throughout the day. So even adding the jelly bean calories, they were eating pretty much the same number of calories before and after adding jelly beans to their diet. But in the soda group, this is how much they started uh, eating. And despite all the added calories from the cans of soda they were drinking every day, they kept eating about the same amount. So with the soda calories added in, no wonder they gained weight after a month of drinking soda. Their bodies didn't seem to recognize the extra calories when they were in liquid form, so it didn't compensate for them by reducing their appetite so they'd eat less the rest of the day. This lack of regulation may be used to advantage, the researchers suggest, if you want to get fat. But what if you don't? If we drink a smoothie for breakfast instead of a solid meal, will our body think we skipped breakfast and make us so ravenous at lunch we eat more than we normally would and end up gaining weight? Uh, okay, well first, is this solid versus liquid calorie effect real? Uh, soda and jelly beans don't just differ by physical form, they have different ingredients. Um, that's a problem with a lot of these kinds of studies. They use dissimilar foods, uh, like this study, comparing liquid to solid breakfast. They either got fruit juices and skim milk for breakfast, or oatmeal with blueberries and apples in it. And lo and behold, study subjects were less hungry after the oatmeal. Duh! Uh, that may not be a solid versus liquid effect. Those are completely different foods. Uh, to test for a solid versus liquid effect, you'd have to use the exact same food in just two different forms. Even this study was flawed. It purported to show that eating apples before a meal is so good at filling you up, you eat fewer calories overall, but that pureed apples weren't as effective. But they didn't just blend the apples. They baked them for 45 minutes first, which may change how the body handles it. So I'd seen all these studies, but was just not convinced there was a solid versus liquid effect. And then this study was published. A solid fruit salad, raw apples, apricots, and bananas, with three cups of water to drink, or take two cups of that water, add it to the fruit, make a fruit smoothie, and then just drink that third cup of water. Ah, so the identical meal. One in solid form, one in smoothie form. What happened? people felt significantly less full after the smoothie. Same amount of foods, same amount of fiber, but in smoothie form it just didn't fill people up as much as eating fruit au naturel. Originally, we thought it was the lack of chewing. The act of chewing itself may be a satiety signal, and I've eaten enough signal. And indeed, comparing 35 chews per mouthful to 10 chews per mouthful, if you ask people to eat pasta until they're comfortably full, those forced to chew 35 times per bite ended up eating about a third of a cup less pasta. So there we have it. We have the proof of solid versus liquid effect. We have the mechanism here. And as so often happens in science, just when we have everything neatly wrapped up in a bow, a 
paradox arises. In this case, the great soup paradox. Soup, pureed blended soup, essentially a hot green smoothie of blended vegetables, is more satiating than the same veggies in solid form. The same meal in liquid form was more filling than in solid form. So it can't be the chewing. In fact, there doesn't appear to be a solid versus liquid effect at all, since cold smoothies appear to be less filling, but hot smoothies appear to be more filling. So filling that when people have soup as a first course, they eat so much less of the main course that even when you add in the calories of the soup, they eat fewer calories overall. So how can we explain this paradox? Uh, maybe pureed fruit is less filling than solid, but pureed vegetables are more filling? I guess you could try making apple soup or something, but who's going to do that? Purdue University. To prepare apple soup, they mixed about a cup of apple juice with two cups of apple sauce, liquefied in a blender, and heated it up. If you have people eat three actual apples instead, uh, they start out pretty hungry, but within 15 minutes of apple eating, they were hardly hungry at all. Drinking three cups of apple juice didn't cut hunger much at all, but what about the soup, which was pretty much just hot apple juice with applesauce mixed in? It cut hunger almost as much as the whole apples, even more than an hour later, and even beat out whole apples for decreasing overall calorie intake for the day. What's so special about soup? What does eating soup have in common with prolonged chewing that differentiates them from smoothie drinking? Time. It took about twice as long to chew that many times, and think how long it takes to eat a bowl of soup compared to just drinking a smoothie. Eating slower reduces calorie intake. Or maybe we just imagine the soup to be filling, and it's like a placebo effect. Feelings like hunger and fullness are subjective. People tend to report hunger more in accordance with how many calories they think something has, rather than the actual caloric content. If you study people with no short-term memory, uh, you know, like in that movie Memento, where they don't remember what happened more than a minute ago, they can overdose on food because they forgot they just ate, which shows what poor judges we are of our own hunger. And it's not just subjective effects. In this famous study, Mind Over Milkshakes, if you offer people two milkshakes, one described as indulgent, decadence you deserve, the other sensible, guilt-free satisfaction, people have different hormonal responses to them, even though they were being fooled and given the exact same milkshake. And finally, maybe it was just that the soup was hot, and warmer foods may be more satiated. So how do we figure out if the solution to the soup mystery was time, thought, or temperature? If only this study had a third group. They had a solid eating group and a liquid drinking group. If only they had a liquid eating group too. And they did. They also offered the fruit smoothie in a bowl cold to be eaten with a spoon, very unsoup like So if it was thought or temperature, the fullness rating would be down by the liquid drinking, the smoothie. But if it was just the slowed eating rate that made soup as filling as solid food, then the number would be up closer to the solid eating group, and it was exactly as high. Meaning the only real reason smoothies aren't as filling is because we gulp them down. But if we sip them slowly over time, they can be just as filling as if we ate the fruits and veggies solid. Wow, this, this study thought of everything. You don't know the half of it. They also wanted to see if uh, it would work with high-fat smoothies, so uh, what, almond butter or walnuts? No, the LF drink was a liquefied fat smoothie of steamed pork belly. I guess sometimes smoothies can suppress your appetite. If you split women into two groups and tell them to eat as much soup as they want, but half are given big spoons and told to eat fast, and the other group is given small spoons and told to eat slow, the slow group ended up feeling more satiated despite eating less food. 
The thought is that prolonged meal duration can allow more time for our own bodies I've had enough signals to develop before too many calories have been consumed. After all, we evolved for millions of years before cooking, when you know, undomesticated fruits and vegetables were much tougher and fibrous. Our body is built to expect us to take our time to eat. There weren't any blenders on the African savanna either. In smoothie form, you can drink fruits and vegetables at about two cups a minute, uh, ten times what it might take to eat fruits and vegetables in solid form. Liquid calories can be consumed so quickly they can undermine our body's capacity to regulate food intake at healthy levels. It's not the liquid texture per se, but the high rate of consumption at which liquids are normally consumed. And so blend all the smoothies you want, but better to sip them slow over a half hour or so, rather than gulping them down. Even slowly sipped, though, an all-fruit smoothie may not be as filling as whole fruit, so the more greens you can add to your smoothie, the better. And you can add ground flax seeds. The thicker the smoothie, the less hungry you may be one, two, even four hours later, and flax seeds make for thick, milkshaky type smoothies. One tablespoon of flax seeds was found to significantly suppress appetite and calorie intake, less hunger, more satiety, more filling, less prospective food intake, meaning you give someone a meal two hours after the tablespoon of flax, and they eat significantly less, all the while dropping our cholesterol. This is just one week after about a tablespoon a day. The Fat, naturally found in flax seeds, can also help maximize the absorption of fat-soluble phytonutrients. There's a, there's a threshold for optimal absorption that can be reached with just like three walnuts worth of fat. So if you're trying to reduce added fats, a green smoothie with some nut seeds or avocado can enable us to take full advantage of the healthiest foods on the planet, dark green leafy vegetables. Smoothies also allow us to eat parts of fruits and vegetables we might not otherwise. So like if instead of lemon juice here in Mayo's basic green smoothie recipe, you used a little wedge of lemon instead, you might get some seeds and peel, which in vitro at least appear to suppress both breast cancer and colon cancer cell growth. Clinical studies on smoothies show what you'd expect to see from eating great foods like greens and berries improved uh, enhanced athletic uh, performance and recovery, boosting the antioxidant power of your bloodstream, potentially improving arterial function in the short term and the long term, uh, kiwi fruit smoothies protecting against DNA damage, strawberry smoothies against inflammation. Of course, so would presumably just eating greens, kiwis, and berries intact. There has been concern expressed that drinking green smoothies would bypass the nitrate-reducing bacteria in the mouth, but our body's way too smart for that, and pumps nitrate back into our salivary glands, so even if you deposited greens directly into your stomach with a tube, you'd still produce the nitric oxide so important for artery health. Concerns have been raised that the oxalic acid in vegetables might increase kidney stone risk. But as I've explained in the past, if anything, the opposite might be the case. So are there any downsides of smoothie consumption? Whether lemon juice or a wedge, smoothies can be sour. And anytime you're eating or drinking something sour, you have to be careful about eroding the enamel on your teeth. If you soak teeth in a smoothie for an hour, significant enamel is eroded away. But who soaks their teeth in a smoothie for, you know, an hour. So, but what if instead of studying the effects of smoothies in situ, meaning in position, uh, as opposed to in vitro, meaning in glass? I mean, if you make people wear slabs of enamel in their mouths while they drink a smoothie to replicate a typical tooth exposure, they do find almost as much erosion as drinking Diet Coke. So it's recommended that smoothies be consumed through a small a straw, similar to the advice given for other acidic uh, you know, beverages like soda or hibiscus tea. Compared to control, drinking juice through a straw has less of an acidic effect than swishing it around your mouth, so avoid swishing smoothies around in your mouth. And uh, you want to wait at least an hour before brushing, so as not to brush your enamel in a softened state, but rinsing your mouth out with water after drinking a smoothie is a good idea, as it can help rinse away some of the acids to protect your teeth. 
And one final caveat for smoothies. When I advocate green smoothies to boost fruit and vegetable consumption, I'm talking about whole food smoothies, not made from juice or added sugars or human organs. Some women choose to consume their afterbirth. Uh, though described as replenishing and delicious, the problem with eating your placenta is that one of the functions of the placenta is to filter out toxins, and so may be contaminated with heavy metals, as well as pose a food poisoning risk if consumed raw, like in a smoothie. Green smoothies are great, but I'd be cautious about drinking certain types of red smoothies. One of the most prestigious medical journals in the world editorialized that climate change represents the biggest global health threat of the 21st century, and currently chronic diseases are by far the leading cause of death. Might there be a way to combat both at the same time? For example, riding our bikes instead of driving is a win-win-win for people, planet, and pocketbook. Good for us, the environment, and cheaper too. Are there similar win-win situations when it comes to diet? Well, the same foods that create the most greenhouse gases appear to be the same foods that are contributing to many of our chronic diseases. Meat, fish, eggs, and dairy were found to have the greatest environmental impact, whereas grains, beans, fruits, and vegetables had the least impact. And not only did the foods with the heaviest environmental impact tend to have the lower nutritional quality, but also higher price per pound, thereby you know, scoring that win-win-win scenario. The European Commission, the governing body of the European Union, commissioned a study on what individuals can do to help the climate. In terms of transport, if Europeans started driving electric cars, it could prevent as much as 174 million tons of carbon from getting released. Uh, we could also turn down the thermostat a bit, maybe put on a sweater. But the most powerful thing people can do, shift to a meat-free diet. Uh, what we eat may have more of an impact on global warming than on what we drive. Uh, even just cutting out animal protein intake one day of the week could have a powerful effect. So even just like meatless Mondays may beat out working from home all week and not commuting. And a strictly plant-based diet may be better still, responsible for only about half the greenhouse gas emissions. Overall, studies have suggested that moderate dietary changes are not enough to reduce impacts from food consumption drastically. Changes to healthier diets without significant meat and dairy intake reductions may only result in rather minor reductions of environmental impacts. This is because the average fossil energy input for animal protein production systems is like 25 calories of fossil energy input for every one calorie produced, uh, more than 11 times greater than for grain protein production, for example, which is down around 2 to 1. Researchers in Italy compared seven different diets to see which one was environmentally friendliest. They compared a conventional omnivorous diet adhering to dietary guidelines to an organic omnivorous diet, conventional vegetarian, organic vegetarian, conventional vegan, and organic vegan to what the average person actually eats. For each dietary pattern, they looked at carcinogens, air pollution, climate change, effects on the ozone layer, the ecosystem, acid rain, and land, mineral, and fossil fuel use, and this is what they came up with. This is how many resources it took to feed people on their current diets, and this is the negative effects the diet is having on the ecosystem and the adverse effects on human health. Now, If they were eating a healthier diet, conforming to the dietary recommendations, the environmental impact would be significantly less. An organic omnivorous diet would be better, similar to a vegetarian diet of conventional foods, beaten out by an organic vegetarian diet, conventional vegan, and organic vegan diet. The Commission report described the barriers to animal product reduction, largely lack of knowledge, ingrained habits, and culinary cultures. 
Uh, proposed policy measures include meat or animal protein taxes, uh, educational campaigns, and putting the greenhouse gas emissions info right on food labels. Climate change mitigation is expensive. A global transition to even just a low-meat diet, as recommended for health reasons, w could reduce these mitigation costs. A healthier low-meat diet would cut the cost of mitigating climate change from about 1% of GDP by more than half. A no-meat diet could cut two-thirds of the cost, and a no-animal product diet could cut the cost 80%. But many aren't aware of the cow in the room. It seems that very few people are aware that the livestock sector is one of the largest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. But that's changing. Uh, the UK's National Health Service is taking a leading role in reducing carbon emissions. Patients, visitors, and staff can look forward to healthy, low-carbon menus with much less meat, dairy, and eggs. For evidence shows that you know, as far as the climate is concerned, meat is heat. The Swedish government recently amended their dietary recommendations to encourage citizens to eat less meat. Even if we seek only to achieve the conservative objective of you know, avoiding further long-term increases in greenhouse gas emissions from livestock, we are still led to rather radical recommendations, such as cutting current consumption levels in half in affluent countries, an unlikely outcome if there were no direct rewards to citizens for doing so. Fortunately, there are such rewards, or important health benefits. By helping the planet, we can help ourselves. The stress-reducing effects of music appear to extend throughout the clinical spectrum, even to the critically ill, intubated in an intensive care unit. Those with headphones on their head playing Mozart cut stress hormones like adrenaline in half compared to those with headphones playing nothing, resulting in a lower mean arterial blood pressure. But are all types of music just as relaxing? Researchers compare the effects of Mozart versus Pearl Jam versus Enya on normal, healthy subjects. What do you think they found? After listening to Mozart for 15 minutes, people reported a significant reduction in tension. With New Age music, they also got a reduction in tension, more relaxation, less hostility, but reports of a significant reduction in mental clarity and vigor. And after grunge rock, people said they felt more hostile, tired, sad, and tense, with reductions in caring, relaxation, clarity, and vigor. Uh, but these were just subjective measures, asking people you know, how they felt. What about objective measures? Well, we do have data on techno. After 30 minutes of classical music, the stress hormone cortisol significantly dropped. But if instead of listening to Beethoven's Symphony No. 6, Opera 68, they listened to Cybertrip's Technoshock Technomagnetico, stress hormone levels went up. Now, endorphin levels went up too, which you may think, oh, that's nice, until you realize that endorphins are our body's natural painkillers and go up after a variety of aversive stimuli, like getting burned or prodded. This may just be a function of the tempo, though. People get the same bump in breathing and blood pressure listening to fast classical music, uh, Vivaldi's Presto, as stimulating or even more so than the Red Hot Chili Peppers. What about heavy metal music? Participants were randomly assigned to self-selected classical, heavy metal, or silence. Listening to self-selected and classical music produced increased feelings of relaxation, as well as sitting in silence, but not so much for the heavy metal condition. Compared to relaxing and pleasant Renaissance music, exposure to arousing and unpleasant heavy metal caused a heightened amylase response in men. Amylase is an enzyme in our saliva that digests starch, and so when we go into fight-or-flight mode, 
we can immediately start churning out the enzyme to provide sugars for quick energy. So you get a spike when you go skydiving, or if someone dunks you in near freezing water, or if you make a guy listen to heavy metal for 10 minutes. With all that extra enzyme, if he's eating bread while banging his head, he could end up digesting it better. Metal is more likely to cause the medical community indigestion, though. Although the American Medical Association's Group on Science and Technology admits there's no evidence that this music has any deleterious effect on the behavior of adolescents, that doesn't stop them from suggesting there's anecdotal evidence that those who identify with such bands as Slayer and Metallica may be at risk for drug abuse or even participation in satanic activities. To which one doctor wrote in to reply that for every teenager who commits suicide or some crime under the influence of heavy metal music, there may be dozens of white-collar criminals engaged in such activities as insider trading, fraud, and corruption. Maybe we should instead be blaming Bach or Barry Manilow. A 2014 systematic review and meta-analysis of dietary patterns and depression concluded that a healthy diet pattern was significantly associated with the reduced odds of depression. But out of the 21 studies they could find in the medical literature, they were only able to find one randomized controlled trial, considered the study design that provides the highest level of evidence. And it was the study I profiled in Improving Mood Through Diet, in which removing meat, fish, poultry, and eggs improved several mood scores in just two weeks. We've known that those eating plant-based tend to have healthier mood states, less tension, anxiety, depression, anger, hostility, and fatigue. But you couldn't tell if it was cause and effect until you put it to the test, which they finally did. But what could account for such rapid results? Well, eating vegetarian does give you a better antioxidant status, which may help with depression. Also, uh, as I previously addressed, how consumption even a single carbohydrate-rich meal can improve depression, tension, anger, confusion, sadness, fatigue, alert, and calmness scores among patients with PMS. But what about long-term? Overweight men and women were randomized into a low-carb, high-fat diet, or a high-carb, low-fat diet for a year. By the end of the year, who had less depression, anxiety, anger, and hostility, feelings of Rejection, tension, fatigue, better vigor, less confusion, or mood disturbances. The low-carb dieters are represented by the black circles, and the low-fat dieters are represented in the white. These sustained improvements in mood in the low-fat group compared with the low-carb group are consistent with results from epidemiological studies showing that diets high in carbohydrates and low in fat and protein are associated with lower levels of anxiety and depression and have beneficial effects on psychological well-being. The overall amount of fat in their diet didn't change in this study, though, but the type of fat did. Their arachidonic acid intake fell to zero. Arachidonic acid is an inflammatory omega-6 fatty acid that can adversely impact mental health via a cascade of neuroinflammation. It may inflame our brain. High blood levels in the bloodstream have been associated with a greater likelihood of suicide risk, for example, and uh, major depressive episodes. How can we stay away from this stuff? Well, Americans are exposed to arachidonic acid primarily through chicken and eggs. But when you remove chicken and eggs and other meat, we can eliminate preformed arachidonic acid from our diet. So while high-quality treatment studies investigating the impact of diet on depression are scarce, there is that successful two-week trial. But even better, how about 22 weeks? Overweight or diabetic employees of a major insurance corporation received either weekly group instruction on a whole food plant-based diet or no diet instruction for five and a half months. Uh, there was no portion size restriction, no calorie counting, no carb counting, no change in exercise, no meals were provided, but the company cafeteria did start offering daily options such as lentil soup, minestrone, bean burritos. 
had no meat, eggs, dairy, oil, or junk, yet they reported greater diet satisfaction compared with the control group participants who had no diet restrictions. How'd they do, though? More participants in the plant-based intervention group reported improved digestion, increased energy, better sleep than usual at uh, week 22 compared with the control group. They also reported a significant increase in physical functioning, general health vitality, and mental health. Here's this all kind of represented graphically, where the plant-based group beat out controls on nearly every measure. There was also significant improvements in work productivity, thought to be due in large part to their improvements in health. So what this study demonstrated was that a cholesterol-free diet is acceptable not only in research settings, but a typical corporate environment, improving quality of life and productivity at little cost. All we need now is a large randomized trial for confirmation, but we didn't have such a thing until now. Ten corporate sites across the country, from San Diego to Macon, Georgia, same kind of setup as before. Can a plant-based nutrition program in a multi-center corporate setting improve uh, depression, anxiety, and productivity? Yes. Significant improvements in depression, anxiety, fatigue, emotional well-being, and daily functioning. Lifestyle interventions have an increasingly apparent role in physical and mental health, and among the most effective of these is the use of plant-based diets. The right side of the heart, shown here in blue, pumps deoxygenated blood from the body to the lungs, where it can fill up with oxygen. And then the left side of the heart, shown here in red, pumps oxygen-rich blood from the lungs to the rest of the body. So blood travels from the body to the right side of the heart, to the lungs, to the left side of the heart, back to the body. But what if you're still in the womb? When you're a fetus, your lungs don't work because they're filled with fluid. So how does your heart bypass the lungs and spread the oxygen-rich blood coming in through the umbilical cord to the rest of your body? Before we're born, we have an extra blood vessel called the ductus arteriosus that directly connects the right side of the heart with the left side of the heart, bypassing the fluid-filled lungs, until you're born and you take your first breath, and then this blood vessel closes. But in about 1 in 10,000 births, this blood vessel closes prematurely while the baby's still inside, necessitating an emergency C-section. Most cases for which there's a known cause thought to be related to taking anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin or ibuprofen. This is because the way your body keeps this blood vessel open is with a class of inflammatory compounds called prostaglandins. If you take an anti-inflammatory drug, you can undermine your body's ability to keep it open, and it could constrict closed prematurely. That's why most authorities recommend that these NSAID anti-inflammatory drugs be avoided in the third trimester. The likelihood anything bad is going to happen is extremely remote, but better safe than sorry. Sometimes, this premature constriction happens even when women are not taking drugs, though, so-called idiopathic cases, which is doctor speak for we have no idea what causes it. Well, if anti-inflammatory drugs can cause it, though, what about anti-inflammatory foods? A few years ago, I profiled two cases apparently caused by pregnant women drinking chamomile tea, one of which reversed. The ductus opened right back up once the tea was stopped but the other baby had to come right out. Since then, there have been other case reports. For example, a woman who had been eat, drinking a few ounces of an acai berry drink every day, or another woman who was drinking prune juice, and a violet vegetable juice containing a blend of fruits and veggies. Pregnant women should therefore take special care when consuming lots of these powerful anti-inflammatory berry nutrients. What about berries themselves, and green tea, and all the other wonderful anti-inflammatory foods and beverages out there? This group of researchers in Brazil compared ultrasounds of third trimester babies' hearts inside moms who ate a lot of these anti-inflammatory foods compared to women who ate less, and they could tell a difference. The speed of the blood through the ductus in the anti-inflammatory diet moms was higher, suggesting it was narrower, just like when you pinch the opening of a hose closed and make water shoot out faster. 
and also the right sides of their hearts of the babies in the anti-inflammatory diet moms were larger than the left side, suggesting some blood backup, again an indicator of a tighter ductus. The researchers suggested changes in late pregnancy diets may be warranted, but critics replied that, look, the, the differences they noted may not have any clinical relevance, meaning it may not matter if the vessel is a little more open or closed. And look, we don't want to freak women out, as many of these anti-inflammatory foods may be beneficial, like cranberries, for example, which may be useful in preventing urinary tract infections, which can be a risk factor for premature birth. So cranberries are attractive public health and cost consideration standpoint, if it can prevent some of these preemies from being born too early. So you know, before cutting down on a healthy food like cranberries, we'd want some stronger evidence that they're potentially harmful. Uh, what about confounding factors? For example, maybe women who ate lots of anti-inflammatory foods had other characteristics that could affect fetal blood flow. You know, what we would need is an interventional trial, where you take pregnant women, change their diets, and see what happens. But we didn't have such studies until now. And a few weeks during third trimester, cutting back on anti-inflammatory foods like tea, coffee, dark chocolate, grapes, and citrus did indeed seem to open the ductus a little bit. Uh, now this was during normal pregnancies, and women whose fetuses had abnormally constricted vessels, a few weeks of removing polyphenol-rich foods reversed the ductal constriction in 96% of cases. Now, importantly, they didn't follow these babies after birth to see if it made any difference. Um, uh, you know, that complete closure only happens in 1 in 10,000 births. Uh, we're not sure what effects just kind of relative levels of constriction may have, so it's too early to be instituting a ban on dark chocolate for pregnant women. At this stage, uh, we're left with just kind of a note of caution. So during the rest of life, uh, I recommend piling on these healthy foods like berries and cocoa powder, but from about 28 weeks until birth, uh, pregnant women may want to cut back until we know more. In 1985, a Swiss pathologist noted Alzheimer's disease-like changes, plaques and tangles, in the brains of about three-quarters of a small group of men and women in their 50s and 60s who had died from other causes, whereas most brains collected under age 30 were clean. But these studies just involved a few dozen people. Based on thousands of autopsies, one can see what appears to be the first silent stages starting even in our 20s in about 10% of the population, and about 50% by age 50, uh, just as the first malignant cells in cancer fail to produce any clinically detectable symptoms, but represent a larger, more potentially life-threatening disease process, the presence of these tangles in the brain may constitute a true threat. The high prevalence of the first stage of the disease, even in the young, and its extraordinarily long duration— most people don't get diagnosed with Alzheimer's until their 70s— had not been fully appreciated until now. We now understand that neurodegenerative brain changes begin by middle age, and so does cognitive decline. We start losing brain function in our 40s. Before people are diagnosed with Alzheimer's, they're diagnosed with what's called MCI, mild cognitive impairment. Uh, that's when cognitive decline becomes clinically apparent. A few years later, Alzheimer's may be diagnosed, which then results in death. But we never knew what was happening before mild cognitive impairment was diagnosed, until now. There appears to be a slow decline in brain function, the buildup of plaques and tangles in the brain for decades before Alzheimer's is diagnosed. This finding potentially has profound implications for the prevention of dementia. We have to start early, before marked brain loss has occurred. The good news is that brain disease is not inevitable, even after age 100. Oldest woman in the world retained the brain power of those practically half her age. Had she not died from stomach cancer, she could have kept on thriving. Turns out there's no such thing as dying from old age. 42,000 consecutive autopsies were studied in centenarians, those living past 100, though most were perceived to have been healthy just prior to death, even by their physicians, succumbed to diseases 
in 100% of the cases examined. Not one died of old age. Until recently, you know, advanced age was considered kind of a disease in and of itself. But people don't die as a consequence of old age, as commonly assumed, but from diseases, most commonly heart attacks. But not in our 115-year-old. One of the most intriguing findings was that her body showed no significant atherosclerosis, and the arteries in her brain were clear as well. And that may have actually been one of the secrets to her mental clarity. There is emerging consensus that what is good for our hearts is also good for our heads. In 1901, Augusta was taken to an insane asylum in Frankfurt, Germany, by her husband. She was described as a delusional, forgetful, disoriented woman who could no longer carry out her homemaking duties. She was seen by a Dr. Alzheimer, and was to become the case that made his a household name. On autopsy, he described the plaques and tangles in her brain that would go on to characterize the disease. But lost in the excitement of discovering a new entity, a clue may have been overlooked. He described arteriosclerotic changes, hardening of the arteries, within her brain. Uh, we typically think of atherosclerosis in the heart, but atherosclerosis involves virtually the entire human organism, our entire vascular tree. And one of the most poignant examples of the systemic nature is the link between coronary artery disease, de degenerative brain disease, and dementia. Back in the 70s, the concept of cardiogenic dementia was proposed. Dementia generated from the cardiovascular system. Since the aging brain is highly sensitive to lack of oxygen, since heart problems are so common, it was easy to imagine that's how dementia could result. And now we have a substantial body of evidence that strongly associates atherosclerotic vascular disease with the number one cause of dementia, Alzheimer's disease. Autopsy studies, for example, have shown that individuals with Alzheimer's disease have significantly more atherosclerotic narrowing of the arteries within their brain. Uh, this is what our cerebral arteries should look like— open, clean, allowing blood to flow. This is what atherosclerosis in our brain arteries looks like— clogged with fat and cholesterol, closing off the arteries, restricting blood flow to our brain. What kind? of brain arteries do you want in your head? Normal resting cerebral blood flow. The amount of blood flow circulating within our brains is about a quarter a minute, but we lose about a half percent a year. So by age 65, we may be down 15 20%, but this doesn't necessarily affect brain function as we have a built-in buffer. However, this age-related decline in cerebral blood flow can become critical to brain cell survival if an additional burden further lowers that flow. This reduction of blood flow can starve the brain of oxygen, cause silent little mini-strokes, brain atrophy, shrinkage, the cumulative effects of which appear to play a pivotal role in accelerating and augmenting the development and evolution of Alzheimer's disease. If you look at the amount of atherosclerosis in the arteries that specifically supply blood to critical memory and learning centers of the brain, this is the amount of severe atherosclerosis one sees in healthy, non-demented controls, compared to those with Alzheimer's disease. In light of such findings, some have even suggested the disease be reclassified as a vascular disorder. This is good news, though, because atherosclerosis is potentially reversible. These findings were confirmed in two larger studies, over a thousand autopsies each which found the same thing. Atherosclerosis in the brain is significantly more frequent and severe in those with Alzheimer's disease. This suggests that strategies proven to delay the progression of artery disease, like plant-based diets, may be useful in preventing or treating Alzheimer's disease. Of course, autopsy studies are a little late for that, so to assess the impact of intracranial arterial narrowing, on the progression from mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's disease, researchers followed 400 folks with cognitive impairment for four years, using CT angiography, special CAT scans, to evaluate the amount of brain artery blockage. The cognition of those with the least 
atherosclerosis in their heads it remained pretty stable over the years. But those with more cholesterol buildup got worse, and those with the most blockage rapidly declined. And the same with the ability to carry out activities of daily living. And it doubled the progression to full-blown Alzheimer's disease. An inefficient blood supply to the brain has very grave consequences on brain function. But does treatment of vascular risk factors like high blood pressure and high cholesterol actually make a difference? We didn't know until now. 300 patients with Alzheimer's and those with all their vascular risk factors treated showed significantly less decline, less kind of slowed progression of their disease than those who went untreated. It is said that the goal of medicine is to provide patients with hope, and when there is no hope, with understanding. Well, for the first time in the history of this disorder, we have the chance to provide Alzheimer's patients with hope. Nitrates, concentrated in green leafy vegetables and beets, underwent a great makeover a few years ago from inert substances to having profound effects on the power plants within all of our cells, reducing the oxygen cost during exercise, meaning we can bust out the same amount of work with less oxygen. So one little shot of beet juice allows free divers to hold their breath for over four minutes. They get about a half minute longer. And for others, this improved muscle efficiency allows athletes to exercise at a higher power output or running speed for the same amount of breath. I profiled this discovery in an unprecedented 17-part video series, the longest I think I've ever done. It's just so fascinating. But that was back in 2012. What's happened since? Well, this all led to many athletes, elite and amateur alike, consuming beetroot juice prior to competition. But what does the new science say? Well, most of the studies were done on men. It turns out it works on women too, even African American women, and even more neglected research demographic. Same workload power outputs using significantly less oxygen after drinking beet juice. But forget beet juice, what about whole beets? Cheaper, healthier, you can find them in any produce aisle. But there had never been any studies on actual beets until now. Whole beetroot consumption acutely improves running performance. They gave physically fit men and women a cup and a half of uh, baked beets, which is equivalent to about a can of beets, 75 minutes before running a 5K. They started out the same, but uh, during the last mile of the 5K race, the beet group pulled ahead, compared to the placebo group, who were given berries instead. Though they were running faster, their heart rate wasn't any higher. If anything, the beat group, group uh, reported less exertion. Faster time with less effort? They don't call them block rock and beats for nothing. But if nitrates are so good, why not just take them in a pill? Nitrate supplements with names like Hellfire, um, although they can work, their long-term safety is questionable. Non-vegetable sources of nitrates may have detrimental health effects, so you want to improve our performance, we should really ideally obtain nitrates from whole vegetables. The industry knows this, so instead markets an array of nitric oxide-stimulating supplements. However, there's little or no evidence of the performance improvement following supplementation with these so-called NO boosters. The evidence is with the vegetables. How much money can companies make selling beets, though? So how about a novel beetroot-enriched bread product? We've tried to get people to eat their fruits and veggies, and where has that gotten us? But hey, lots of people eat white bread, so why not have them eat red bread? And indeed, it worked. Red beet bread brought down blood pressures, improved the ability of arteries to relax and dilate naturally. Bread, therefore, may be an effective vehicle to increase vegetable consumption without significant dietary changes, because heavens forbid people should have to change their diet to improve their health.
It's great that we can improve athletic performance eating a few beets, but so what if you run 5% faster? It can be a fun experiment to eat a can of beets and maybe shave a minute off your 5K time, but these are the people who could really benefit from a more efficient use of oxygen, those suffering from emphysema. Yeah, young, healthy adults eating greens and beets can swim, run, cycle faster and farther, but what about those who get out of breath just walking up the stairs? Do nitrate-rich vegetables work where it counts? Yes, significantly extended time on the treadmill after two shots of beet juice. It's great that beet juice can decrease blood pressures in young, healthy adults, but what about those who really need it? Older, overweight subjects. Just one shot of beet juice a day versus berry juice as a control, and in a few weeks a significant drop in blood pressure, but within just a few days after stopping, after three weeks of beating themselves up, blood pressure went back up. So we have to eat our vegetables and keep eating our vegetables. Why did it take until 2015 to publish a study on lowering blood pressure in people with high blood pressure? You'd think that'd be the first group to try it on. Who's going to fund it, though? Big Beat? Blood pressure medications rake in more than $10 billion a year. You can't make billions on beets. But that's why we have charities, like the British Heart Foundation, which funded a study to give folks with high blood pressure a cup of beet juice a day for four weeks. After all, high blood pressure may be the number one risk factor for premature death in the world. In 10 years, it could affect nearly one in three adults on this planet. But put them on beet juice, and blood pressures dropped, and kept dropping until it was stopped after a month. With so many people with high blood pressure, even despite treatment, an additional strategy based on the intake of nitrate-rich vegetables may prove to be both cost-effective, affordable, and favorable for a public health approach to hypertension. What about those with peripheral artery disease? Tens of millions with atherosclerotic clogs impairing blood flow to their legs, which can cause cramping pain in the calves called claudication uh, due to lack of blood flow through the blocked arteries, severely limiting one's ability even to just walk around. But just drink some beet juice and walk 18% longer. Now this, this is really neat. I've never seen this before. They measured the actual oxygenation of their blood within their calf muscle. Placebo's in white, beet is in black, showing how they were able to maintain more oxygen in their muscles with just vegetables. The nitric oxide from vegetable nitrates not only improves oxygen efficiency, but oxygen delivery by vasodilating blood vessels, opening up arteries so there's more blood flow. I'm surprised beet juice companies aren't trying to position themselves as veggie Viagra. It could certainly explain why those eating more veggies have such improved sexual function. Uh, though this study was just a snapshot in time, so you can't tell which came first. However, it seems more reasonable that low fruit and vegetable consumption contributes to erectile dysfunction rather than the other way around. What about the most important organ, the brain? Poor cerebral perfusion, lack of blood flow and oxygen in the brain, is associated with cognitive decline and dementia and they show that the nitrate in vegetables may be beneficial in treating age-related cognitive decline. They showed a direct effect of dietary nitrate on cerebral blood flow within the frontal lobes, the areas particularly compromised by aging. Uh, this is a critical brain area for so-called executive function, you know, basic task and problem solving important for day-to-day -day functioning. The nitrite from nitrate has been shown to not just to increase blood flow to certain areas of the body, but also acts preferentially in low oxygen conditions, allowing it to increase blood flow precisely in the areas where it's needed the most. And that's what they found in the brain. Increased blood flow to the at-risk areas of the aging brain. And the only side effects of beating your brains out? A little extra color in your life. The dietary guidelines recommend that we try to choose meals or snacks that are high in nutrients but lower in calories to reduce the risk of chronic disease. By this measure, the healthiest foods on the planet, the most nutrient-dense, are vegetables, containing the most nutrient bang for our caloric buck. So what would happen if a population centered their entire diet around vegetables? They might end up 
living among the longest lives in the world. Of course, any time you hear about long-living populations, you have to make sure it's validated, as it may be hard to find birth certificates from the 1890s. But validation studies suggest that indeed they really do live that long. The traditional diet in Okinawa is based on vegetables, beans, and other plants. I'm used to seeing the Okinawan diet represented like this, the base being vegetables, beans, and grains, but a substantial contribution from fish and other meat. But a more accurate representation would be this. If you look at their actual dietary intake, we know what they're eating from the U.S. National Archives, because the U.S. military ran Okinawa until it was given back to, Japanese, uh, to Japan in 1972. Uh, and if you look at the traditional diets of more than 2,000 Okinawans, this is how it breaks down. Only 1% of their diet was fish. Less than 1% of their diet was meat, and same with eggs and dairy. So it was more than 96% plant-based, and more than 90% whole food plant-based, very few processed foods either. And not just whole food plant-based, but most of their diet was vegetables, and one vegetable in particular, sweet potatoes. The Okinawan diet was centered around purple and orange sweet potatoes. How delicious is that? Could have been bitter gourd or soursop, but no, sweet potatoes. So, 90 plus percent whole food plant-based makes it a highly anti-inflammatory diet, makes it a highly antioxidant diet. If you measure the level of oxidized fat within their system, there's compelling evidence of less free radical damage. Maybe they're just genetically have better antioxidant enzymes or something? No. Their antioxidant enzyme activity is the same. It's all the extra antioxidants they're getting from their diet that may be making the difference. Most of their diet is vegetables. So, 8 to 12 times fewer heart disease deaths than the U.S. You can see they ran out of room for the graph for our death rate. 2 to 3 times fewer colon cancer deaths seven times fewer prostate cancer deaths, and five and a half times lower risk of dying from breast cancer. Some of this protection may be because they're only eating about 1,800 calories a day, but they were actually eating a greater mass of food, but the you know, whole plant foods are just calorically dilute. There's also a cultural norm not to stuff oneself. The plant-based nature of the diet may trump the caloric restriction, though, since the one population that lives even longer than the Okinawa Japanese don't just eat a 98% meat-free diet, they eat 100% meat-free. The Adventist vegetarians in California, with perhaps the highest life expectancy of any formally described population. Adventist vegetarian men and women live to be about 83 and 86, comparable to Okinawan women, but better than Okinawan men. The best of the best were Adventist vegetarians who had healthy lifestyles too, like being exercising non-smokers. 87 and nearly 90 on average. Uh, that's like 10 to 14 years longer than the general population. 10 to 14 extra years on this earth from simple lifestyle choices. And this is happening now in modern times, whereas Okinawan longevity is now a thing of the past. Okinawa now hosts more than a dozen KFCs. Their saturated fat tripled. They went from eating essentially no cholesterol to a few Big Macs worth, tripled their sodium, and are now just as potassium deficient as Americans, getting less than half of the recommended minimum daily intake of 4,700 milligrams a day. In two generations, Okinawans have gone from the leanest Japanese to the fattest. As a consequence, there's been a resurgence of interest from public health professionals in getting Okinawans to eat the Okinawan diet too.